All right. Uh, so I know it's the it's the four o'clock. So it's the one where everybody is like half asleep from uh, from coffee and and and, uh, and all that stuff. So I'm gonna try to uh, to compensate on the energy. Uh, so let's start by a quick rundown. Do we do we like third parties in this room? Do do we like stuff like Boost or Catch? Yeah, we do. Okay, nice. I even hear some uh, cool. So this is gonna come uh, back in this talk, as you might uh, as you might guess. So um, I, I, I'm pretty sure you know this guy. Um, he said something two years ago at CPPCon in the intro keynotes. We said uh, that we need a better package uh, manager or build system. Um, so that was. <laughs> Two years ago, and two years ago, he pitched uh, the workflow of how it should work, like a very, very sm quick outline. So the idea is that if someone wants to use a third-party library in C++, he should just be able to type something like download with the name of the thing he wants to actually install on his machine and use. Uh, then uh, he says install, that, that's a bit confusing right there, but uh, the idea is that download actually downloads whatever it is and possibly uh, installs it or whatever it builds it. Install sets it up for your current project. It's, I, I, we'll come back to that. And, and then it was done. And then uh, you can just open your, uh, your, your, your favorite IDE and just do import. Yeah, this was 2017, we still thought that module was gonna be like just ne next day. So, uh, I mean, I can't blame him from the optimism. That, that's cool. Uh, so yeah, well, without module, you would just pound include, but the idea is basically the same. So that was two years ago. The question is, what do we have today? Because he pitched it as something very important that the community has to overcome. So how far have we gone from that? So, hello, my name is Mathieu. Uh, you may or may not me about my, uh, my over talks about uh, CMake and uh, Build, and I literally try to talk about something else sometime um, with uh, some measure of success. Uh, I'm actually a game developer uh, these days. Uh, I work at Paradox Development Studio when we make awesome games like Europa Universalis, Imperators, and others that are also awesome, but I don't work on them, so I can't talk as much. Uh, you can reach me on all those kinds of uh, various social media. So uh, what is this talk about? Uh, so we're gonna talk about why package management. I mean, if you're in this room, you're probably somehow convinced or at least curious about package management. I think it's good that we just talk a bit more about why do we want this? Why did Bjarne say, it's himself said, this is important, we need this? Uh, then we'll look at what we have today, uh, what solutions are available to, to you right now that you could use at the, at the, at the end of, uh, of this talk. Please, don't ease in the, please wait for the end of the, the session to do it, because I, I like my audience focused. Uh, how to make your library packageable, uh, because it's one thing to actually uh, use other software, but there is also something you can do if you're a library maintainer to help. Uh, people uh, to actually use your stuff easier. And of course then we look at the future because uh, the road is still, uh, is, is still uh, long and we still have something we could do better. All right, let's start by why. Okay, so uh, I mean, at the end of the day, our job is to get stuff done, right? We, we write programs that are supposed to do something. Um, so let's say today that you start writing a program and you say, I'm gonna stick with the standard. I'm gonna make a standard C++ 17 program. Uh, I know that not all of us are, uh, just, just for a quick check, how many of you are using C++ 17 already? Okay, so I'm, I'm already in the science fiction realm now because I think that was like a quarter of the room at best. But le okay, let's, let's take a hypothetical situation. Let's say you have C++ 17 uh, and you can use it. Uh, what, what can you do with it? Well, you can do file IO. You can open files, you can read files, you can write files. And you can close them. Awesome. Um, you can use the file system now. You can navigate the files. Uh, before Sp 17, you couldn't. Now you can. You can look at open a directory, look what's there, move files, rename files, great stuff. Uh, you can write on the console uh, text, um, preferably in ASCII. Um, you can uh, read the command line arguments to a great technology, which is called an int and uh, an array of pointers. You can access the environment variable. Well, at least you can get them. I'm pretty sure setting them is uh, platform defined, but at least you can access them. So that's something, uh, and that's about it. So, I mean, I make video games, right? So this is a bit short if I want to make a video game. Uh, I mean, maybe in, in 85, I could have made a 
cool video game. And even then, uh, like a text adventure thing, you know, like when they ask you, you stand in the middle of a, of, 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 of a clearing and you can go north, south or, north or south and you can just type what you're doing. But today, I mean, my clients uh, expect a bit more. So uh, out of the box today, with uh, your standard C++, you cannot access anything uh, HTTP. Uh, or network at all, actually, in, uh, for that matter. You cannot display any kind of GUI in 2 or 3D. You can just write stuff on the console. Uh, you cannot play sound. Uh, you cannot access any kind of database. So basically, at best, you can only read files. Uh, and if, even if you can read files, you cannot actually understand them unless you re-implement zip, jpeg, json, and all those great formats that have been existing for at least a decade. <laughs> Oh, and uh, don't even get me started on Unicode. So, I mean, we do a lot of software, especially in C++, that is really about hard computation, but that's not all of it. A good deal of them, they need, they need more than just a console UI and, and, and just like using the CPU full, 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 full stop. Um, so it's very hard to kickstart new development. You, you come and you say, hey, I'm going to write a project in C++. Uh, I don't know about you, but um, when I was in school, there was this, uh, this moment when you can uh, be offered to pick a project for your second or third year, and you can pick basically what you want. You just gather with a bunch of uh, friends from school, and you have to make a project, and we sh to, to, to open your creativity, we just let you do anything. What do half the students respond? Let's make a video game. <laughs> and then they look at C++ and mm, they um, try in Java. Uh, or, or they discover OpenGL and that's another story. Um, so yeah, what I'm saying is that it's especially harmful to education. And that was one of the big points that uh, Bjarne was making in his keynote. Teaching C++ today so that we get engineers after us. Because uh, that software is not going anywhere. Someone. Someone will maintain it, improve it, hopefully, do more stuff with it. But it's getting harder and harder to, uh, to sell it to students. Because look at all these cool things they cannot do compared to like a bootstrap in Node.js in five seconds, minutes maybe. Um, so how can we solve this? Well, option number one, which we've seen recently, which is just push it in the standard because, hey, everyone has the standard, so everyone will have it. So that's why we have the networking TS. Uh, that was, there was a 2D proposal, which I don't think is going to go through for now. Uh, that's why we had a study group on databases that I don't think is uh, active anymore. And we also have a study group on Unicode. I really hope they, they, they get something out of it. Um, or you use a third party library, like which basically is the elephant in the room. Uh, because when you think about it, C++ doesn't lack in quality or even quantity uh, in terms of, uh, of good libraries that you can use. Uh, everybody knows Boost, uh, we mentioned Catch, uh, Curl, FFmpeg, blah, blah, blah. You, you, you see what I'm meaning. Like, we have pre-existing software that does the job. Uh, but here is the thing. Every time I uh, go to a conference, there is like this bingo card. It's a very small bingo card because I have only two bucks to take. But it is my personal bingo card when I go to a talk. When someone presents a new library, there's two keywords I'm waiting for and half the time I hear them. And I used to do a lightning talk in response every time I heard them. This time you get the full talk. That's great. Uh, the first one I had, it said Hanley. <sighs> That's not even the topic today. And it has no dependency. What? You're trying me to pitch, you're trying to pitch me a dependency, and the first positive thing you say about the thing is that it doesn't have a dependency. So it's like, wait, if having no dependency is great, why are you trying to pitch me a dependency? Like, what is happening? So, why are we doing this? I thought pretty hard. Why are we doing this? Um, well, option A, we don't trust code made by others while we implicitly ask them to trust the one we write. Option B, we are afraid of package management, and we think that, uh, that we, we actually having to do, deal with that will drive users away. I think A deserves a great talk, but this is not the topic today, so I'm sorry about this. I will only have the time to answer the second one. But I'm glad to have your opinion on the first one. So, using external libraries in C++ historically has not been great, right? Um, 
it's uh, it's it, 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 it's quickly painful. Uh, we have different operating systems. Don't even get me uh, started on dependencies of dependencies. Uh, when you start having a graph, it's like all the fun. Uh, and then you have to f figure out, okay, uh, let's say I use a, a good deal of uh, third-party libraries. How do I redistribute everything to make sure that my client, when he runs my banner, he does not get a pop-up saying it's missing half the symbols, because that's not fun. Also, what happens if my client also has those libraries? Uh, not fun stuff. So the idea of package management is basically what we try to teach things I don't know, forever, probably, the idea that you should leverage on the code made by others, right? Like, we, we, we like the, the STL and we did not write it. We're just happy it's there because it, it makes us go faster. And that's the same thing for everything that is not the STL, but is also good quality. Um, of course, we want that to work regardless of the platform or the environment, which is when the first problem starts, uh, starts, starts, starts showing up. And also, uh, the, the second thing, we don't, like, we want a low cost. Because if it looks so hard to use a third party library, we're just gonna say, ah, oh, forget it, I rewrite it. I mean, I've seen it, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. No, I see a bunch of um, people agreeing, okay. Uh, yeah, don't reinvent the wheel, that's what we tell people, don't reinvent the wheel. But if you don't want them to reinvent the wheel, make the wheel cheap to use. It's not a new topic, like, at all. Like package management has been something that Linux distribution have been doing forever. If you ever used uh, like RPM, uh, I think it's been packaged into something else now, but yeah, RPM, uh, Emerge, uh, package ports, blah, blah, blah. They all have funny names, but Unix has been doing that forever. D Un Linux distribution, BSD distribution, they, they all do that. Uh, and if you look at the new languages, the, the things that are uh, more uh, coming like from the last decade uh, at best, they, most of them, or, or maybe all of them, offer a package manager. I mean, there is always someone to raise his hand and talk about Cargo or NPM or whatever. There is stuff like that. I mean, Perl in the 90s at CPAN. And you could actually use it. The first time I got DSL, I used TPAN, and oh my god, I got Perl module installed. That was that was crazy. Uh, but native platforms are not that, that easy to handle compared to a lot of those languages. We have some fun things like ABI or um, or a lot of uh, build system and compilers that have evolved very differently over the years and drifted apart. Because that's the thing, C++ is not a new language, as I said. It's 30 year old, more than that even. And sometimes you even use stuff from, that is written in C that might be even older. Uh, so we cannot uh, invent a new standard that will solve everything. People are like, why can't we do cargo? Well, there is a good reason for that. I don't have a magic wand that can turn the million packages or libraries in the world into something that would build with cargo. It, it needs actual hands to actually make it, and that's very, very painful. So basically, uh, we have to work with what we have. Hopefully, we would like people to change over time to something more easy for us to package, but it's not like we can force them tomorrow to merge to, to move to something. Worse, there are several initiatives that try exactly that. So it, it becomes a first mover disadvantage. If you're the first guy to change your library to this new model that only works with this shiny new thing, suddenly you're out of the ecosystem. You're in your own ecosystem and the only package there is yours. And it, you're like the first guy who bought a telephone. Who the fuck are you gonna call? Nobody. And, and so what, what you want to do is wait for other people to go there. And yeah, in economics, they call that first mover disadvantage. The first, that, the first guy going there is going to basically pay for all the costs, or most of the costs, compared to the next one who come. Apple realized that a long time ago, and that's why they're successful. So yeah, you want to avoid that. You, you don't want to be the first guy to move to something and, and, and be there alone. You want the others to, to, to follow you, and it's very hard, especially if there are multiple options, because chances are you're going wrong. Uh, if you remember HDDVD versus Blu-ray, I hope you don't have HDDVD at home, because, uh, yeah, basically gathering dust. Okay, um, for the rest of this talk, I uh, would like to distinguish two different use cases because usually the answer to, the, to, to your problem might be different. Uh, the first one is what I call open environment, uh, which is that basically uh, the idea is that there is an unlimited uh, amount of possible configurations, uh, clients that will use your stuff. 
Uh, so usually it means open source development. You have no idea how many different people will git clone your repo and try to build it on their machine and what they have installed. Like it's infinite. Uh, education is a similar thing. Uh, I, I don't think two schools uh, use the same machines. I don't even think that two departments in the same school would use the same machines. Or most likely they have changed them over generations, all that stuff. So there is basically there is not one true environment. There is a bunch of them and you have to somehow work with all of them. And that comes with a lot of restrictions. On the other hand, you can have a closed environment, which is usually either a private project, which basically only has to work on my machine. On my machine, it will work, that's great. Uh, or uh, a scale version of that, which is called a corporate project, which is usually a company project uh, where you either have like all your servers using the same VM, Docker environment, or simply just an IT guy who makes sure he goes or whatever you use today, install the same IDE on every machine. That's pretty common. Usually you don't want your company to have a million different configuration. There is little to no point. And in those ones, you can do more stuff. You can e more easily about stuff like binary distributions. Um, and basically you have a manageable amount of different configurations. So it opens some new doors. Right, enough of the theoretical stuff, because I mean, you, you're not here to, uh, to hear me talk about the theory, called, you, want, you want solutions. Well, there are, as, I, as I put in the subtitle, there's many options, but there's not that many solutions. Uh, so to explain why uh, and how I uh, cleared out the list to just a, a few, uh, let's explain some stuff first. So how does it work, a package manager? How do you install uh, a package that you want to use? Well, if it's open source, you probably have done this at least once in your life. You uh, install whatever the thing tells you it also needs. So f you start by recursing, because that, that's, that's how it goes. Uh, then you download the sources. Uh, you probably extract them, put them somewhere. Uh, possibly you patch it, because something doesn't work on your machine. Uh, then you run configure, then you run make, or whatever is your uh, equivalent of make, and then you install it, make install, or something similar. That's great. How do you do the same thing with a binary? It's much easier because you don't have to compile anything, so you also install its dependencies, if it has some. That's, that's rarer. Most binary distributions do not, uh, by, like closed source software mostly, don't ask you to install uh, dependencies, but that's not always the case. Uh, OpenSSL is probably the most common one that people might ask you to install because of, for example, export restriction and other stuff like that. Uh, so you just download those binaries and you copy them to your install directories. You're done. Great stuff. And how do you use that now? Because let, let, let's imagine for a moment that you have this directory with all the C++ library in the world compiled and ready for use. How do you do that? Well. Actually, it depends on your build system because we're C++, we don't have one build system. We have like, uh, well, uh, probably as many layers as you can put before make, uh, like uh, Z make, C make, N make, blah, blah, make, I, I stop counting, uh, plus everything that is uh, different or and di didn't want to, to go for the make in the name. So more than 26, possibly. Uh, so let's, let's, let's be simple. If it's CMake, it should be quite straightforward because it's trying to lean into the de facto standard these days. Like, if you have to take averages, that's probably the most common one. So usually, it's quite straightforward to use uh, something that the package manager installed uh, with CMake. Uh, depending on your package manager, it may or may not also allow you to easily uh, integrate with packages uh, for other builds, uh, with another build system. And if everything fails, you can just say, uh, this is the include there, this is the lib there, and just hope that, um, that, that the thing works. That, that's really a last resort. You usually don't want to go there, because it opens other issues. Uh, the thing is, there is, as I said, a surprisingly large number of attempts at solving the package management issues. We have very uh, different, differing approaches on the, on the problem, which is interesting because at least for research purposes, you can see like, that we explore the um, kind of the span of the, of, of, the, of the space of the problem and trying to, to see solutions. But in my opinion at least, and this is the part that is clearly biased in this talk, uh, maybe not enough, uh, so I was told before, um, uh, only a handful uh, really stand out. So 
how did I manage to filter out? I basically made up a bunch of rules and then struck everything that did not follow those rules. So rule number one, uh, because uh, I ship my software for free platforms, so I want Linux OS 6 and Windows to be supported out of the box. Like if one of these three doesn't work, I don't care about it. Uh, the thing is, it's the big three today. Like, if you have a desktop machine or even a server machine, it's going to be one of those three, unless you're still using Solaris or older Unix stuff. But even then, from Linux and OS 6, it's usually not too much of a stretch to go to a similar platform. I know it. I, um, I, in the early days of Conan, I made some patches to make it work with Solaris. Fortunately enough, I don't have to work to Solaris anyway, anymore. Uh, but anyway, the big three. You have to support that. It doesn't mean that all the users uh, will, will, will need them, because like most people don't actually need the free platform for the project, but in the space of, of all the potential users, you will have people belonging to one of those trees, at least. Uh, so right off the bat, I remove NuGet because it's basically made for Windows. I remove Nix because it's basically made for Linux or Unix. Upget, you know, any basically Linux distribution uh, package manager, it only works there, and it's not working on the others. So, sorry. Okay, rule number two. You have to work with the existing ecosystem. Uh, you might say it's arbitrary, but I think it's very important, and that's, we go, we, we, we back to the rule I said. Uh, you cannot expect man maintainers to just switch to a new build system, because sometimes their build is, I don't know how many lines. I'm not saying they should not clean that up. Uh, I kind of accidentally became a, a knowledgeable person on CMake, and most of the CMake list I, um, I, I open make me cry. But in practice, no one has a, not everybody in the world has a budget to rewrite his whole entire build system on a, a shiny new thing, especially if it's new, especially if there are different options, and again, if he doesn't know which one is going to stand out in the end, because if he picks the wrong one, he's going to have to do it again. So basically, that removes Bazel, Build2, Messon, all the ones that basically really uh, ask you to rewrite your own build to use their thing. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm saying they cannot work in this case. Uh, number three uh, might seem a bit reasonable, uh, a bit weird, but you will understand after this one. You have to respect encapsulation. Uh, basically, um, there is this idea that you don't, you should not be intrusive. Uh, you should not put package management intrinsics inside the build file. Like, if I'm writing a build, I shouldn't have to uh, make, uh, put some stuff like, oh, if you're using X package manager, then I need those dependencies with some format, and then if I'm using another one, uh, uh, else with some other uh, calls to get something like, no, I want something standard, I just want to run find package in CMake or something similar, and it will just find my package. That, that's what I want. And for some of them, a hunter is uh, probably the most, uh, the, the biggest culprit there. Just ask you to call hunter in the middle of your CMake list. What if my client doesn't want to use hunter? What if my client fears hunter is not going to be the one? Well, he's stuck. You don't want to lock people in. Number four, handle the diamond problem. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I put some slides just before this talk because I think it's, it's actually a very important issue. So let's say I have a program. <laughs> And I use libA, which in turn use libc. Uh, and then I start using libb, which also use libc. Makes a nice diamond. But obviously, we don't use just a library. We use a specific version of a library. So for example, here, we use uh, version 1.0.0 uh, of a library. But in, in practice, in the world, that's not what happens. You will see lib A say, hey, I want lib C number 100. And then lib B say, hey, I want lib C 1.2.4. And worse, sometimes you will have one using version 1 and the other one using version 2 that are not even compa remotely compatible with each other. And at the end, you're supposed to link all that together. That's a problem. So it's called the diamond problem, and your package manager should be able to do something about it. Either by forbidding it by construction, some of them do that, or by having a way to report to the user there is a package conflict, tell me how to resolve it, or maybe it's unresolvable, but let's stop immediately there. Because debugging that when it doesn't trigger a build error is not fun. Like, not at all. Uh, if you've seen my previous talk on ABI, uh, you might 
discover that sometimes everything links, but your compiler thinks you're using something and you're not using something else and you end up selling the bank and that's not fun. So uh, basically, uh, incompatible version of the same dependencies should be uh, are extremely painful and should be handled in one way, either by a report, a warning, an error, or by construction making sure they cannot happen. So again, enter disappears. Most of the time, anything that you have to put inside your build system will disappear for a simple reason. The package manager cannot know what your build file is doing, right? It's just a black box for him. It's just calling your build, uh, the build of your, pack, uh, of, your, uh, of, your, of your library, uh, and then getting the output. If behind the scenes, the build of your library is installed something else, well, the package manager cannot see it, so it cannot detect a diamond problem, and then you're out of luck. So basically, oh yeah, sorry, I forgot number five, which is the probably the most uh, biased one, be known. I cannot put you in this talk if I have never heard of your package manager, and I'm sorry about all the ones that I didn't know about. There might be some. I don't know which one it eliminates because I don't know about them. Mm. All right, so basically at the end, I ended up with three options. Uh, Conan, uh, VC package, and CGET. CGET is very similar from VC package, but obvious, for obvious reasons doesn't get as much funding as, uh, as VC package. I'm sure you can guess why. So I'm gonna eliminate it, because basically they kind of work the same way, but VC package just has much more investment on it. So obviously, if, if one works for you, go with VT package, because it's just doing the same stuff, but more. All right, so let's start with uh, Conan. So it started in 2015, and I'm looking at Louis to make sure I'm not saying anything wrong. Uh, it's owned by JFrog today. Uh, it's written in Python. There is about 300 uh, packages. When I say packages, it's open source curated packages that should just work uh, for open source perspective, which means whatever your configuration is, you have a huge chance that you can just, 99% um, chance that you can just run Con and tell him to install it and it will just work. Uh, it works on ARM, on, on x86, and on most uh, platforms, uh, at least the big three and also some others. Uh, how does it work? Uh, that's how we show some code, yeah. So uh, you write a thing called a Conan file uh, for your project. You have a small section called requires in which you, uh, uh, you put, the, uh, you put the, uh, the library you want, the version you want, and the channel you want. Uh, I will go back to this. Conan is decentralized. You can have as many channel or providers of package uh, as you wish. Beancrafters is the open source initiative that tries to package stuff for Conan. Uh, and then you say which generator you're gonna use to, uh, to feed your build system. The one I uh, suggest here is CMake Path, which is not the default one. We will come back to that later. Uh, then you want to uh, actually use it. Well, you just create a builder, uh, CD to it, because that, that's, that's what you should do. Do not build inside your sources. Uh, you just run Conan install, and then the same, in the same vein, you just say CMake, uh, you just run CMake, and you feed it the, uh, the file that uh, Conan generated. And basically you're done. You can do like your standard CMake thing of doing like find package G test and blah, 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 blah. The rest is just standard CMake thing. The important part is there. You just run the standard find package G test and since you fed uh, a toolchain file to CMake, it will automatically add the search path of all your, uh, add all the packages you install to the search path. So CMake will just immediately find it. And you're done. You can just open your ID and start making tests. Oh, did I mention that by default today, if you start using standard C++, you cannot make unit tests because there is no framework for that. It's kind of a shame. So Conan is decentralized. Uh, as we've seen, you can have as many remote channels as you want. If you ever use like Ubuntu, for example, you, you probably know this idea, right? You can set up some different sources and then you can say, which repo do you want to pull stuff from? There is a bunch of ones. And there's a bunch of default ones that are installed that, that, uh, that contain good and, 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 and curated packages. Uh, you can, of course, set up your own. And that's one of the, the, the big points of Conan. Uh, like if you're a company and you want only your internal stuff because, I mean, maybe your legal or IT is very worried about downloading packages from the outside world, you can just set up your own repo and have internal company packages, including stuff that you don't want to publish, but still you want all your users to use, internal libraries, for example. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I just ripped off that stuff from the, from, from the pages. But basically, the idea is that you have a Conan client. Uh, it comes up with a, a simple server we written in Python called Conan Server that does the job. If you want more stuff, I'm pretty sure uh, Luis is uh, happy to sell you some, uh, like Artifactory or Bintray. I'm not going to push for that uh, today. Um, it uses binary caching by default, and I think that's the, one of the big difference with the, with the next one. Uh, by default, if it can somehow prove that uh, what already built with your, uh, with your uh, system is, is it compatible with your system, if it has a pre-build that is compatible with your system, it will just download it. Uh, if you ever try to use something heavy, uh, it's a lifesaver, because again, uh, especially if you have a huge company and everyone in this build needs the same package, you can just download the binary every time. Uh, when, you store an inter uh, when you store some recipes on your uh, internal uh, repo or whatever, you can also push binaries there. So again, if you have company uh, internal stuff, you can add your binaries there. They will also get downloaded by everybody. Uh, it saves up some time. It's much, much better suited for a closed environment because describing uh, all the factors that will guarantee that a binary is compatible with a given machine is a nightmare. Like by default, I think the discriminatory of Canon is like five or four uh, things, like what operating system you run, are you 32 or 64 bits, what compiler, what is your runtime. Uh, that is fun, but that is clearly not enough. Uh, because again, if you watch my ABI talk, you know that a lot of other stuff actually matters for binary compatibility. From your C runtime, uh, if you use some ABI options like, uh, like ASAN, for example, or uh, if you use the debug runtime on, on Microsoft, that kind of stuff. So it handles the most common cases, but I, I, I had some times when I just did con an install and the binary just didn't work. You can always force it to say, I don't trust the binaries, build it for my machine with my tool chain and you're done. And then you can store it somewhere for reuse if you want. It's, it's totally an option. So again, if you have a, a small set of different configuration, it works great. If you don't, well, it's just an exponential problem, right, of how many uh, different uh, packages you need to store to make sure you satisfy everybody. Uh, I don't want to run the computation. Uh, or, because I'm bad at math, but also because it's probably a big number. Uh, we use the CMake generator that is not the default one, because the default one, I don't like it, uh, because it's intrusive. It, 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 it asks you to include especially, uh, in explicitly some Conan files and then run some Conan commands inside your CMake list, which basically means your thing, makes your thing unusable with another package manager. With the CMake path approach, you don't have to commit. You can always switch to something else, um, the HDDV thing. <laughs> Uh, the curated package repo is growing slowly. Uh, 300 packages might seem uh, impressive, but it's actually not growing that fast. Uh, the common one has been done, but now it's kind of lacking a bit in pace. Um, also, it allows multiple versions of the same library to be stored on a, on a remote, and you can pick which one you want. As you have you seen when we when we describe the, the requires, I said I want GTS 1.8.1. I could have said another thing. Uh, which means it has, it has something, it can detect the diamond problem uh, using Semver and stuff like that and tell you that something in your dependency graph will probably cause an issue. And they offer some options to resolve them. But it doesn't guarantee by construction that it can only be one version of a package. So for example, it will not force people to upgrade. When you, uh, when you describe which package you want, you, don't, you, 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 you fix a version. And, 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 the, and the people, uh, your package you use, will also fix a version, which can end up in a problem when, no, when you need someone to move to be able to also upgrade. And that, as uh, there are talks about that topic, I think uh, Facebook or Twitter ran, ran into the problem. They had a full decentralized model. And the, the issue it usually brings is that at some point, everybody gets stuck by one package that uh, they have to use the old version to stay compatible with the full dependency tree, and that guy doesn't want to upgrade because he has other stuff to do. And basically everybody is stuck. And, and that, that's an issue. I think uh, if you hear the talk by, uh, by Google especially, they, they, are very, uh, they talk a lot about that issue and how they solved it. Uh, the multi-target generator was still experimental was I, when I written this talk. I think I read something about not being experimental anymore. The idea of the multi-target is that uh, it supports the switching between debug and release. It's mostly a Windows thing, 
But if you use Visual Studio, you know the, uh, uh, the uh, you know that you need to build all your third parties twice usually to when you switch to from debug to release because it doesn't use the same runtime. Uh, by default, Conan doesn't do that. They have an experimental generator, which I'm told is getting better. I haven't tried it yet. Let's go back to, let's go to the second one. Visual Studio, uh, VC package, my bad. Uh, started two years, three years ago now. Yeah, it's 2019. Uh, it's maintained by Microsoft. It's written in C++ and in CMake. Yeah, it's written in CMake. Um, but there are around 800 packages. And if you look at the number I was given for Conan, which has technically a one year head start, they're already more than double, uh, almost triple now. It supports ARM, uh, x86, Windows, Linux, OS X, the big three. I think there are some ventures for BSD, but I'm not sure they're actually officially spotted now. Uh, how does it work? Well, you will find it very similar, except you don't specify your requirements as a file. You just run commands that will install whatever you need locally, and then you require it in your CMake list. So, which means that basically, oh, sorry, uh, if you want people to use your, uh, your pa uh, if you want to make a package, uh, if you want to make a simple thing, you have to like have a pre-built script that just runs uh, VC package install with all the, uh, all the packages you need installed on the machine. So you run VC package install, it just as Conan will store all the build package in a local cache. You can configure as many local caches as you want, usually one per user. That's the recommended thing. You can do one per project if you prefer. Um, then you run CMake, same thing, you feed it a toolchain file, and then you will see that this is exactly the same slide as, uh, as the one for uh, Conan, uh, except the title. It's not that I'm lazy, it's that it just the idea is that it works exactly the same. It just fix up CMake to tell him, hey, look there if you want gtest. And everything should just, just work. Uh, so, uh, contrary to uh, Conan, it's extremely centralized. The, uh, the repository of all the package is basically one git repository. It's one git repo, you do git clone, you have VC package and all the recipes. What does it mean? It means that if you want to update one recipe, well, you can't. What you can do is git uh, pull or git uh, check out up until the revision that has your update. And you also get whatever has changed in the meantime. Which might mean that when you want to upgrade one thing, you will also get whatever else has been uh, updated as a, as a ref target for, uh, for a new package. Which, depending on your uh, company, might be an issue. Like for example, say you want a new version of Boost and you know that the latest head of the VC package repo uh, has the latest version of Boost, well, you do git pull, and possibly a lot of your other recipes will also uh, have been pushed to an, uh, another version. I know that it usually scares people, but there is a very good reason they do that. Uh, I'll come back to it later. It's very fast growing, as we've seen. Uh, they're packaging more and more. Actually, I, uh, I, I know from having talked, uh, talked to the author before I made this talk, that the main goal of VC package is to have as many packages possible. Like, they only patch VC package when they find either a bug or uh, something that cannot be packaged uh, today. Basically, they package it as, as, as the need comes to package stuff. The main goal is to package everything. Or um, the author will tell you, I'm packaging the world. That, that's, that, that's the goal. Uh, it leads to high quality curation. Uh, because uh, one of the big things is that since it's a Git repo, there is only one possible snapshot of the world at one stage, right? Uh, of all the possible dependencies and versions in the world. It's just a linear tree. It's not, it's not a, a combination uh, of all the possible versions. For every git commit, every package has one version and one only. Which means at every commit, they can just spin up some cloud services or whatever and make sure that everything works together and builds. So whatever the commit you check out, unless there is like a bug introduced by that commit, obviously, but every release you check out, you will get 100% almost guarantee that everything works. And more than that, everything works together by design. Uh, and of course, since it was firstly made by, for Visual Studio, uh, it by default will build debug and release. Always, and always handles that. So, which means you can always make sure that the switch in CMake works for you, uh, in Visual Studio works. 
Uh, it comes with some uh, drawbacks compared to Kernan. Doesn't have any kind of binary caching uh, because of the exponential problem and the fact that they want to work with everything. They just said we cannot host binary packages for the world. It's never going to work. Uh, and they don't want to have like 98% of the case covered. They want 100. So the idea is like, nope. You're going to have to build it at least once. Then there is a local cache for your uh, computer. But that's about it. I think they are studying solutions uh, to actually allow you to share that cache with other users locally or whatever, but it's still not the main goal. The main goal is you tap VC package install, it builds what it has to build, and it just works. Um, also, the difference is that the, the workflow is quite different between like a, a user of uh, multiple packages and a maintainer that wants to package this library. Conan will encourage you to consider anything uh, you make with Conan, uh, that uses Conan as a Conan package, even, even a binary. So basically, it means that if you try to uh, write, uh, if you try to use Conan with your project, it will encourage you, it's not, it's not, you don't have to, but it will encourage you to see it as, a, as a, just another recipe for a package that you can install. So usually you, usually you, you get reusability by others out of the box, almost. Whereas for VC package, uh, they almost consider that it's not your problem and it's, that very, that, that it, 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 it's theirs. So if you want to push for that, it's, it's, another, it's another story entirely and it has nothing to do with the experience of just using the package. So what is the, uh, what is the result of all that stuff? Like how, wh how should you use what? My personal suggestion again is like if you want to try a new third party, if you want to try any third party, if you want to have, like, uh, you want to get a quick, uh, you want to, uh, you want to go, you heard about something like in a blog post or after a talk, you want to give it a quick go, VC package install, done, it's going to install it, build it for your machine, and uh, I mean, uh, with a delta of the build time, you can just go immediately and, uh, and try it. Then there, since there is a bigger uh, repo, you have also a higher chance that there is actually be a recipe for that package. Um, if you're going for education, or personal projects, I would also recommend VC package. Again, you tell your student, just do a VC package install, blah, 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 and you can get whatever framework you want to make your uh, student video game or whatever else they want to do. It's, it, it has a huge chance of working. And since today, uh, students have laptops, like in my time, oh, oh sorry, I'm, sticking, I'm already speaking like an old person, but uh, Back in my days, uh, most people had to work at the school because they didn't have a computer at home or they had one but without an internet connection. So they basically just worked with whatever was in the in the in the in, in the in, in the in the machine uh, rooms. Today they all have a laptop, which is probably not the same thing as whatever you run at your, at your university. So they can't not even make sure that the thing will be the same arc or whatever. So VC package will just easily bootstrap them and install whatever they need. Conan is going to be much more interesting if you are going for a corporate environment. When you want to start, basically, anytime you want to start doing stuff like is more advanced, like setting up your own repo, uh, doing your own curation in your in your in your place, saying, okay, this is the internal company repo. We only need, we we only have a small amount of targets. Conan is probably your friend because, well, they have all, that, uh, all this artillery with JFrog that uh, Luis would probably be happy to talk to you about uh, at the end of this talk. All right. Now, how many of you are uh, library maintainers? Okay, so let's say a third, almost half of the room. All right, because this part I can just skip faster if you're not a library maintainer, but we still have some time. So if you have questions, we can, we can I can take some now, or else I can just continue with it and we can ask you a question at the end. Wow, the question, great. Well, let's continue then. So how do you make your library packageable? Well, that's easy, keep it simple. The simpler you build is, the simpler it is to package. Simple as that. That's a lot of simple. All right, so don't be creative. Like, if you can avoid it, just don't be creative. Uh, and when I say don't be creative, I'm not even saying try, uh, don't try something fancy inside CMake. I'm going much more bare bone. I'm saying use CMake. Because here is the thing. Anyone who maintains packages for Canon or VC package or whatever, he has to know CMake because that's the most common, so he had to, at some point, learn it to make recipes. So he knows CMake. 
he might not know your very, very fancy, nice, and new uh, beta version of a build system. Also, it will have to assume that that build system is not installed on the client machine when it tries to build your package, so it will also become a build dependency. Basically, if you st if, if building your package will first mean building whatever build system you need for your package. Uh, so out of the box, it's already two things it needs to package just to package your thing, plus learning whatever your build system is and how it has to make it work with package management. Uh, second thing, expect your users to be working on Windows, Linux, and OS X, unless you're doing something very specific that makes no sense on another platform, and then be very specific about it and, and basically say, I will never have users on those platforms. Assume that there will be people from the free. So try to stick with the standard, or failing that, just use whatever wrapper that will provide you standard uh, access to all that. It's much more simpler for everybody. Um, it's fine if you install your CMake or inside your code, you have toggles like, okay, this piece of code is for Windows, this piece of code is for Linux. Like, it's okay to say, okay, if Windows, just, just use this Win API thing. If POSIX, just, just do a syscall. Uh, it's not an issue. The problem is more when you start expecting uh, people to have stuff that are from that system. For example, a lot of build systems expect you to have stuff like grep or find or a lot of Unix command line tools that are not installed on Windows. And please, just for me, repeat after me. <laughs> no, maybe not, but uh, Min GW and Sigwin are not Windows support. And this is a hill I'm, I'm willing to die on. Like, this is not Windows. This is an emulation of Linux on Windows. This is not Windows. This is not a native Windows build. Please don't ask me to install MinGW and Sigwin every time I need to build your package. Should you use assembly? Well, if you can avoid it, no. Please, please don't. Because that's the thing. Even if all your CPUs are, well, first of all, it brings a problem of portability between ARM and x86. But even if all your CPUs are 86, assembly is actually less portable than C++ for two reasons. Well, first of all, because not two, no two platforms use the same default assembler with the same syntax. So on Linux, you expect it to have something that GAS can understand. On, uh, on Windows, you're something that MASM is supposed to understand. On OS X, I have no idea. I don't think they even have a default. Uh, I looked it up on the internet, and the, the answer is just like, oh, yeah, you just use this package manager to install a YASM or whatever. So yeah, just avoid it. Also, even if you could, because some people try to be smart and say, hey, I will use, Ma I will use YASM or uh, NASM, because technically it's a portable assembler. Except it's not, because the calling convention, it's not the same between the two systems. So even if you made one assembly file, you couldn't have linkage with C or C++, because you would still need to hit F windows and read the variables from different registers. So yeah, I mean, there are some very specific use cases when you need assembly because your compiler just cannot do use whatever fancy instruction of eight consonants that Intel added. I can understand that, but it's very hedge case. And yeah, I would recommend just have one assembler source per target, uh, which means architecture and OS. Uh, you can try to put everything in one file, but that's not going to help. So build dependencies. If you can avoid them, that's also great. When I say build dependencies, it means everything, every, any binary that people need to install to build your stuff, just to be able to use it. Uh, code generators, um, again, assemblers, any kind of exotic build system. Because again, um, it brings a lot of new problems for the, uh, for the package maintainer. The first thing he has to think is, oh, okay, so you need to run this on the compiling machine. So the tool chain is actually not the same one, possibly. Like for example, let's say you cross compiling, which is something people do. Well, all the code generators, assemblers, build systems, they have to be built for the host machine. But then you need to use them to build for a target machine. And I mean, if you ever went to a talk about cross compiling, it's very fun. It's also very, very uh, painful. So yeah, if you can avoid it, please avoid it. Don't hide your dependencies. 
the package manager are really trying hard to solve the diamond problem. They cannot solve it if you hide dependencies from them. So something I've seen a lot in build system, in build files, it's like, oh, try to find something. If it isn't there, well, I guess I can just run a bunch of commands to double you get the source and then build it and then link to it. And then I just, I just linked everything with OpenSSL and I didn't tell anybody. And then my user also uses OpenSSL, but another version, like 1.1 instead of 1.0. And then nothing works. And it's not fun. So yeah, there is a, a good solution for that in CMake, which is the required tag in um, here, in a uh, in find package that just stops uh, the configure step if something is missing, and that's basically the rule of thumb. You can try to check if everything you need is there as much as you want, but if something is missing and you can't build because of that, don't try to fix it. Because you're basically gonna act, uh, you're gonna hide something from the package manager, and then it will have to work around your workaround, and that is not fun. Also, if you can, avoid, if you can, please don't disable a feature and continue, because <coughs> that leads to feature toggles, and feature toggles are not fun for package managers, because if I'm packaging, let's say, OpenSSL. Do you know how many build options you can pass to OpenSSL and how many different things it will or will not build depending on what I put? I don't know either, I just expected someone no and would make a very terrible face because it's probably more than 20. How much? 20 to 30. Yeah, 20 to 30. Well, okay, so I'm not, bad at, I'm not good at math, but can someone tell me the combinatory, the, the combinatory uh, number of packages that you need to build to support all those use cases? It's way too much, that's the answer. So, uh, if you want to have options, it's fine. But uh, John is not in the room, but you can ask him, he will tell you how to do it. And he will show you something like that. Because that's what I see in some packages. You have your lib, and you need OpenSSL. You have an, an optional part of your lib that, that, that deals with SSL, like because maybe you have some crypto features. And you have an optional part of your system that is using SQLite, because maybe you can optionally store stuff in the database. A lot of people do, hey, do I have OpenSSL? Yes, then I will build the OpenSSL plugin and link it in my binary. And same thing with SQLite. Uh, guess what happens if two people uh, have different configuration? That basically means two versions of the library. More fun. Guess what happens if the build server happened to have OpenSSL installed somewhere, but it's technically not a dependency you declare. It just happened that CMake found it and considered that then it was okay. That, that, is not, that is not fun. So what you should do instead looks more like that, which is you have your library and then you build something on top that requires both. Basically, hard dependencies, not optional dependencies. Um, I forgot something in a previous slide. Uh, when you have feature toggle, if someone say, uh, if one of the big, uh, I can't remember, I think curl does that. Uh, if you say to curl, I think, uh, minus minus SSL, and curl cannot find OpenSSL. Do you know what it does? It doesn't fail. It continues without SSL, which is awesome because if you make an error and you recipe as a manager or as someone who just makes a build file, well, you think everything went great because it's still built, except actually it did not. Well, it did, but not with what you thought. So again, you can make a feature test, but if something you need isn't there and explicitly you were told to use it, Say, I cannot stop. Don't say, well, I guess you don't really want it and then continue silently. That, 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 that is just bad. ABI, again, I made a, I made a whole talk about ABI. Uh, every library you build uh, for a package manager has to be ABI compatible with whatever else is gonna be built in this huge graph of uh, dependencies. I'm saying huge graph because I hope that you will also at some point have a lot of dependencies because you will reuse a lot of reels and codes and that's awesome. Uh, but the idea is anything you package manager build, it has to ensure that it can be actually, it can be compatible with the toolchain you use. And what do people do a lot in their CMake list when they find something that they don't like? Well, they change it. Do you know how many libraries, I, 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 I'll stop with the quiz because I don't even have the numbers to make sure you're right, but uh, you're probably right. Uh, a lot of libraries love to say, hey, I'm on Windows. I will silently replace the runtime flags from the static one from the dynamic one because I like it. 
And the package manager is like, no, I told you to build with the dynamic runtime. Why are you putting the other one? That, that's, that's not going to work. That's not going to work because you're literally lying. Over, we, we, we're telling you to build with something. You say, yeah, but I don't like it. I'm just going to build something else instead. Uh, a lot of people like when they detect Clang to automatically switch to libc++. Well, no, maybe the user won't libstud C++ because that's still the default on Linux and they don't want to ship the standard library with it. They just want to use Clang as a compiler. That's perfectly normal. Don't say, and I'm saying that I had to patch it on this, on VC package itself, because the, the recipe take care of that, but the, 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 the build of VC package itself, which is, uh, which is C++, did not. Irony, right? Uh, so I have a small uh, guide if you want some help. You can probably change warning flags, optimization flags, debug flags, standard flags. That's the one that surprised me the most. You can change standard flags. It's going to be fine. Your compiler writer will go to great lengths to make sure that you are still binary compatible with someone who uses another version of the standard. I mean, unless you force C++ 17, use it when the rest of the people are using C++ for free, because then they're not going to be able to pass your headers. But if it's just internal, it's fine. Just don't try to put a higher standard than what you're required to do uh, in your public headers. That, that's not going to work. On the other hand, uh, anything that starts with minus M is bad news, because it's architecture flag, and it means, yeah, let's change the architecture I'm targeting. Why not? Uh, one of the big ones is, of course, optimizing for a specific CPU. Why not? Uh, it's going to be a problem if someone redistributes that and the target CPU is not the same. Oops. Uh, I'm not even talking about doing M32 or M64, but I've seen it. It's not fun. At least it doesn't link. Uh, runtime fly, I told it, like minus stdlib, uh, slash mt, slash md. Nope, 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 nope. Don't change that. Sanitizer flag. Uh, ASUN is not binary. It's not always binary compatible with uh, with other things. So if you want ASUN, well, just ask for a toolchain with ASUN. Some defines can actually break it too. Uh, I haven't seen that a lot, but I have seen it. People say, "No, I hate iterator debugging. I will just disable it from my library." Well, no, don't do that. Because maybe the guy who is building a whole uh, project needs iterator debugging. And he, your iterators are not binary compatible anymore. And if you're lucky, Microsoft will detect it when you link the program and say, oh, those two objects don't seem to match. <sighs> GDX, CPU, CX, 11 ABI. It's probably a thing of the past now uh, because it starts with GCC 5. Uh, but GCC changed its ABI and they still support both in new versions. Uh, if you change this flag, it changes which one you're supposed to link with, and that's caused a lot of issues, so don't do that either. Basically, the idea is, if I can just create a small toolchain file uh, that just tells me what is my compiler, what is my C flags, my CXX flags, and I come to your project and I say, CMake, with that toolchain, make, make install, it should build. It should build and not try to do any magic behind the scenes. That, that's as simple as that. Right. What is next? We have 30 minutes, which is great. I think I'm talking a bit too fast. So what's next? Again, uh, why is it so slow? Because that's maybe something you might want to ask, right? Like, it's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been saying for, I mean, it's not new that we said that package management is something we need, but the progress is, you might argue that it's not that fast. Well, again, C++ is not a new language, right? Uh, build is not part of the standard. I don't think it will ever be. Uh, we have 30 years behind us, uh, yeah, behind us of diverging practices. There has been a lot of effort to actually remove that. Like Microsoft, for example, is working super hard at removing any compiler extension they used. Uh, Clang and GCC are trying to work together, but still, like, Fundamentally, Windows and Linux works differently, and don't even get me started on OS X. Uh, we have to, it's, it's not easy, right? Like everyone went his merry way because there was no standard, and now we're trying to retrofit a standard out of that. It's not an easy task. It's gonna take some time. And conversion is easy, right? I mean, we all remember that one. Like, they, hey, 
It's been 30 years, we have like five standards, let's make a sixth one, that, that's just gonna work. No, it's probably not gonna work. Uh, especially uh, because, yeah, like we say, there's just gonna be one more standard because we cannot expect everybody to move. Especially if there are three different proposals and none of them seems to emerge. So basically we have to work with what we have and we can try to package everything as ugly as it is, as diverging as it is, as something that others will understand. We can basically wrap all the non-standard thing into a new standard, a de facto standard maybe, like something people would agree on, which I would say today is kind of CMake. I'm not saying you have to be married with CMake. I, I, I'm not a fan of CMake myself, but it does the job and we can change that afterwards. But first we have to agree on something. And of course, new projects should be higher uh, to a higher standard. Like, basically, you should be able to guess the, um, the age of a project by the amount of custom scripts needed to package it. Something old and terrible like OpenSSL or... Uh, I'm coming again at OpenSSL, but have you ever tried to build it on Windows? How was it? The answer, I spent two days, I gave up. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I think I spent an hour and I just said, no, I just installed it with Conan and then copied the binaries. Uh, I'm not proud of it, but at least it worked. Uh, no, uh, and, and that's not the only one. I have some, uh, I have some, uh, some links at the end if you want to have some fun with it. Uh, yeah, so the idea is new pro a new project should basically be an empty uh, script file. It just should be able to run CMake and done. An older project, yes, we might have to patch something, but a new project, we would have to expect more and better. CMake is not the best, sure, but if you try to go solo today with your own super fancy build system that solves everything, well, you just created one of those 15 standards we saw in the picture. And I mean, unless you have like the force of maybe Google, Microsoft, and a bunch of others combined and can tell everyone to switch to it immediately, and I think only maybe the standard would have that power, and I'm not even sure, because I don't think it would pass, you will never uh, replace everything with your thing, like overnight or, or even quickly. So you know what, CMake is there, it's probably the most common today, let's work with it. Again, if you're staying to simple things, a CMake list is very dumb. You declare a project, you find some stuff, you had a library, you just say, hey, this is the sources from my library, and then you link them, and you're done. Like, I can write a parser in, in half an hour that can translate it to basically any other DSL. If you start making macros that change the flags, then, then, then we're in trouble. So, yeah, basically, write simple CMake lists, Run some checks. It's perfectly fine to check that you have everything you need to build. But if something isn't met, bail out and tell the package manager why. Well, mostly the package maintainer, because the package manager is just a binary. He will not be able to understand. But the package maintainer will. He will see a messaging, hey, I don't have this. And then he will see what he can do. Don't try to fix the problem yourself, because you're just hiding a problem. One thing that I think is not discussed enough is toolchain files. Uh, I think it almost needs to talk by itself, but the idea is, today, what I observe a lot is that inside the CMake file, we try to detect what is the operating system, and then we set, we set everything we expect for a project. So like optimization flag, a uh, bunch of defines, and you should do that the other way around. You should have a bunch of toolchain files. This is, oh, this is how I build for Windows, this is how I build for Linux. And then you feed that to CMake, and your CMake list is super clean. Uh, of course, if your library has some requirements because you actually need some third parties to work, well, r tell it in the readme. It's going to be easier than uh, having the uh, package maintainer guess what it needs to, uh, to, to pre-install for your package to work. Uh, what is to come? Well, obviously, uh, more standard. Again, not maybe uh, literal C++ ISO standard, but like uh, industry standards. Like, for example, if we had a simple way of describing the requirement, like a simple text file that just say, I want this, that, and that, well, then package manager wouldn't even have, maintainers wouldn't even have to, uh, to pass your CMake list or your readme to know what they need to install. They could just mechanically pass that file, install what you say you need, and then run. And, and, and packaging is basically automatic at this point. It, there is no need for a recipe anymore. 
the next thing is to produce a package manifest upon install, a standard one. Because the problem is today, we rely on CMake finders. That's okay-ish. But first of all, uh, not all projects in the world have a CMake finder. So you need to generate one. Today, the solution is to generate one for CMake. What would be nice, I would like to see one day, is some kind of manifest that says, hey, this is the library I installed. This is the flag I built it with. This is the dependency I used, blah, 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 blah. And then, of course, a finder in CMake could be able to read that and use it. It's kind of package config, except it needs more because package config was clearly fought for C, and it breaks down when you start pushing for C++. But this is the same ID. It's some kind of standard manifest that makes it more easier to just fit it to, uh, to whatever build system people will use, because hopefully it will not be stuck for, with CMake forever. And then it would come handy because instead of having to convert the CMake file manu the, 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 the finder.cmake manually, they can just read that thing with a new build system of the future and use it. What we need to do, to do basically is lower the cost of entry. Because as long as package management is complicated, people will still have this old reflex that I talked at the beginning, which is, ah, you know what, not worth it, I will just rewrite it. Or I will just publish everything header only because I'm afraid that people will not be able to compile it. Uh, and then people will complain of the build times. Guess why? Um, so yeah, lower the cost of entry. That's, I think, one of the big things uh, we need to work on. Uh, we're getting there. Uh, VC package and content, as you see, have a simple workflow, kind of. Uh, you might still, like, if you don't know what you're doing, uh, it, might, uh, it might be a bit more complicated. The big thing, again, I haven't seen any installer or uh, whatever, when you install a new compiler, uh, be it the super fancy wizard of uh, Visual Studio or the good old apt-to-gate uh, install uh, GCC. None of them will actually generate a toolchain file from, the, from this that has sensible defaults. And when someone starts uh, doing C++, they say, yeah, I read this thing about C++, it's awesome. How do I get started? Um, and then he's being told he needs to uh, understand what ABI means uh, to generate a toolchain file. Uh, he's probably going to look at another language. You can also ask his teacher to provide one, but then again, maybe he doesn't have the same machine. So what would be awesome is that when you install your compiler today, it just auto-detects whatever you have and just say, hey, this is your default release, this is your default debug, you can just build it, it's going to be fine. Maybe if people then want to maintain it and change it, having some kind of nice wizard to just manage your profiles and say, yeah, I kind of want a version with Asan and just put whatever flag you need. Uh, another thing we can, uh, we would like to to have is, uh, oh, at least I, uh, is support from the build system, like some kind of streak mode that I can just say to CMake, run in streak mode. Every time someone tries to install something out, just stop him. Uh, every time I try to require something and it's not op and it's optional, just just make it required. Basically, stop immediately if you see a pattern that's going to be incompatible with package manager. One of the uh, thing I would love to say is block them from changing ABI flags. It's a very hard problem because ABI flags are not defined, it's just a bunch of strings and it's very hard to know all of them. It's, it's kind of not solved today. But yeah, basically report patterns in build files that are incompatible with package management so that people can just yeah, run some kind of sanitizer, like a static check on, the, on their build files and then fix them. Uh, Autofix would be even better, like Clang Tidy does, but let's start somewhere. So how can you help? Well, try a package manager. I'm pretty sure uh, Luis is very happy, will be very happy to make you a demo just outside this room. I don't have anyone from BC Package to make one. I can try with my laptop, the Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi is not that bad, so we can probably do something if you want to check out how it works. Uh, if you own a library, please make it packageable. Make sure that all of that stuff is done. If you're already packaged by VC Package, there is a chance that it has already, that some commit has been, or some pull request has been made. But most of the time, when given the choice of saving a patch with a hack in the, in the, in the RecIP in my package manager or, patch, or, or trying to patch the upstream, the package, man, the package maintainer would just say, you know what, I'm just going to store a patch in my send. That's what VC package does, for example. For every three or four uh, uh, build, it, 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 it fixes, it will just keep, uh, one of them will get an upstream patch. So there's probably a bunch of them, possibly your libraries, that actually have a bunch of acts on the Visual Studio side, or VC package side, for example, or the content side, to make sure that your build is closer to the standard. 
it would be great if you could look at why they had to do this and just integrate those changes in your, uh, in your own library. You might have to tell your users where you did that. That might change their workflow, but then you will also discover that they're probably doing something that's going to be a problem for them when they want to go into package management themselves. <sighs> Submit a reach IP for kernel VC package. Obviously, if you, if you have a package, uh, a library, and that is not package, and you want people to use it e uh, easily, like, it would be awesome if you can end all your talk about your new library by, hey, you can just run this command on kernel or Visual Studio at the end of this talk, and you get my package, and you can try it out. Most of the time, uh, not, not most of the time, but uh, a good deal of the time, you can't. You just leave people with the GitHub and have fun with the README. And of course, tell your friends that package management is a thing and that they should try it. And that it's cool. Uh, so yeah, package manager already out there. Write, uh, keep in mind that you need to write packageable libraries. Uh, you don't need to do packaging yourself. That's, that's the extra mind. I'm, I'm glad, uh, people will be glad if you do it. But just making packageable libraries is already a good step. Uh, document what you need uh, for people to package your libraries, mostly like dependencies, but possibly other stuff like known incompatibilities, that kind of thing. And look about this toolchain fine thing, because I, I still think it's not the default. And also if you like maintaining a compiler or distribution or whatever, if you can push your uh, distribution to generate one by default and then educate the users to the fact that that's the default thing that should be done, uh, that would be great. And that's about it.